God in prayer. Uh, does anybody have any specific prayer requests that they would like to make known? All right, well, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, sovereign Lord above, whose glory is above the heavens, whose glory is manifested in all of the earth, we thank you so much for the gifts that you've given to us. We thank you for the gift of life, uh, for the abilities that we have to live, to function, uh, to, to the ability to thrive here on this earth. We, we thank you for the ability to have a good night's rest, the ability to eat a meal, the ability uh, to have uh, friends and fellowship and, and a church family um, that we could come to in times of sorrow and grief and joy and pain. Father, you are sovereign over our lives, and we just want to express our gratitude and our thankfulness to you each and every single day, and we pray that our hearts may continually draw closer to yours, that we may know you and experience you more every day. Please uh, transform us into your son's image every single day. Father, we pray for the sick of this congregation. Be with all those who um, have had recent surgeries and who are, having, are going to have upcoming surgeries. Please be with all of those who have experienced loss and who may be grieving. Uh, please comfort them and help them to know the peace that surpasses understanding that's available to you. Father, we pray for our mission here at Highland Heights. We pray that we may be dedicated to seeking and saving the lost of this community and, uh, and in this world as well. Uh, God, we pray uh, your, your hand may be with us each and every moment and we may grow to become more like you every day. Father, we pray for Afghanistan, we pray for Haiti, uh, we pray for the city of Waverly. We pray for our soldiers uh, that are in harm's way. Uh, we pray for our enemies. We pray for those who may persecute us. And we pray for those who are being persecuted. All of those under your Son, Father, that don't know you, we pray that they may embrace you in relationship. And we pray that those who have embraced you and submitted to your Messiah, may continue in the faith and may pursue your cause and continue to preach your word and your gospel in this world. Thank you again for all of the magnificent gifts that we have from you. Please change us every day and help us to be like you. It's through the name of your son we pray. Amen. All right, uh, so we are beginning a new study uh, starting tonight on God's providence. Uh, now, if you saw, I think... FH sent out an email a couple days ago uh, that the ladies class is also studying uh, providence. Uh, I blame it on the providence of God that we're studying providence in here and in, in the ladies class. That wasn't uh, by design, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure both classes will be, will be very, very, very beneficial. Uh, several days ago, Anna and I took Titus uh, to the little kiddie pool here at Don Knox uh, or Don Fox, Don Fox Park, not Don Knox. It's Don Fox, right? Yeah, Don Fox. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we took him to the little uh, kiddie pool. He has a, a little floaty that, that we put uh, that we gave him, and, and he just enjoys it so much. He looks like a, a little. I looked up under, up under it, and his little feet looked like a like a little duck paddling as fast as <laughs> as fast as he could. And he was trying to get away from me, uh, so he could uh, travel around in circles. And and they've got um, uh, stuff that shoots out water in there. And he was trying to reach for the water and, and everything. Uh, but but it was just so funny to watch him uh, do that. Uh, I was when when he was in his float and and wanting to travel around um, to the different. Uh, like the, they had a fire hydrant and some other contraptions there that shot out water. But as he was traveling around uh, that pool, he didn't know that I was right behind him. He didn't know that I was guiding him, that I was providing for him, that, that, that I was protecting him all along the way. And that's very similar to the way God's providence works. Uh, God is active in our lives 
God works in this world to uh, accomplish His purposes. Uh, He is here. He is omnipresent, and He is actively working um, in each and every single person that submits to Him. Uh, so this is what we're going to be studying, the providence of God, and, uh, and, and as we go through this, we're, we're going to look at some introductory material, but we're going, at the end of this study, Lord willing, we're going to look at the value um, of a topic like this, how it can deepen our faith in Jesus Christ and draw us closer to Him, and, uh, and some objectives um, that we can uh, personally pursue as well. Uh, so let's look at... Uh, just a few introductory matters as far as uh, the providence of God uh, goes. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13, verse 14. We're going to be looking at several passages of Scripture. I'm pretty sure I have every one of those on the PowerPoint, uh, so you can jump ahead of me if you like and mark your place. Uh, But go ahead and look at Romans chapter 13, verse 14. The word translated providence in the new, in, not providence, providence, and we'll get to that here in a moment. That's, that's a way that's helpful to pronounce it, providence. Uh, but uh, one of the prominent Greek words that's translated providence, especially in the New American Standard Bible, Bible uh, the King James Version, and and the um, and and the, the the old King James Version and the in the new King James Version is pronua, pronua. Um, and uh, one of those, it's, it's translated, uh, it's used twice, that word. It's used twice uh, in the New Testament. Once, one of its usages is in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, and it's translated provision. It says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now, of course, in this verse, we know that Paul commands the Romans not to provide for themselves an opportunity to sin. Now, in the same way, providence has to do with the act of providing, someone providing something uh, to another person. And it's helpful, like I said before, it's helpful if we pronounce the word providence. God's providence is His providence for His creation, for the world, uh, for the created order, and for his followers, his providence. Another word, another word that um, is um, that this, that this Greek word is, is translated um, is uh, is used in Acts chapter twenty four verses one through two. Acts chapter twenty four verse one through two. This is the English Standard Version. It says, And after five days the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus, they, they, they laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation. This same Greek word here that was translated as provision in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, is translated as foresight um, within Acts chapter 24, verses 1 through 2. When we think of foresight, the idea here, foresight signifies guidance or control. When somebody has foresight over something, they oversee something. They have control over it, and they offer guidance um, and, and direction for whatever they're controlling. Um, so God's providence, His foresight, has to do with His control over this natural world. God is in control of all things. Uh, Wayne Jackson defines providence uh, this way. He says, God's maintenance, God's providence is God's maintenance of the functional balance of the natural world, the fulfillment of the divine purpose, in the regulation of, in, of internal affairs, and his special operation in the lives of those who seek 
to do His will. In short, providence is God's work in the world. Providence is God's work in uh, the world. Uh, so let's look at several different uh, worldviews, uh, how people um, view God and God's work in the world and, and compare them to a biblical worldview. This is very helpful um, as we study uh, the, the, the biblical doctrine of providence. Um, there are several different worldviews that, um, that uh, teach about how God interacts in this world. Of course, one of those worldviews is, is the atheistic Worldview, and, and and we know, of course, that uh, that worldview says that there is no God. There is there is no um, supernatural uh, being um, that created the natural order. Uh, from an atheistic worldview, everything around us was formed by natural processes. Everything that you see was formed naturally. Billions and billions and billions of, of years ago, all matter, they say, most many of them, all matter was compressed into the size of a ballpoint pen. And then, uh, since it was under so much pressure, it exploded. And that began the process of macroevolution, uh, which, um, which created every single thing that you see around you naturally. That's a very rough explanation of, of, uh, of what they believe, but it, it's uh, essentially the case. Um, they believe that God is not involved in the world because He simply does not exist. Um, therefore, um, if God does not exist, and even an honest atheist will admit this, um, if God does not exist and God does not interact in the world, then life is completely and utterly meaningless. Atheist Bertrand, Bertrand, Bertrand Russell says this, Unless you assume a God, the question to life's purpose is meaningless. If there's no such being that transcends us, that's greater than us, that has created a moral standard for us to live up to and a mission for us to pursue, then uh, the question of life's purposes, if you're honest with yourself, is absolutely meaningless. Uh, so that's the athe atheistic worldview of, of, of who God is and how He works in the world. Another worldview in which several world religions embrace is the pantheistic worldview. Um, and that worldview teaches that God is everything. God is literally everything. The creation is God. Um, and it, it, it encompasses several uh, world religions, parts of Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, the, the mystic religions, New Age uh, religions uh, are, are um, embrace this pantheistic uh, worldview. Uh, the pantheistic God d does not have, he doesn't, do doesn't have a will. Um, he doesn't have a, a divine purpose and cannot act in or upon the universe. So from a pantheistic perspective, uh, providence is uh, essentially non-existent. Since God, if God is everything, if I am God, if you are God, if this podium is God, if everything you see around you is God, um, then uh, and God has no mind, essentially, then that God cannot have a will, that God does not have a mind, and cannot act upon uh, the behalf of its followers. Um, that's the idea of God and how God works from a pantheistic uh, worldview. Um, another one is a Calvinistic uh, worldview. Um, and before I say this, to be, f to be fair uh, to Calvinists, because many people within Christendom, uh, evangelical, most evangelicals embrace at least one of uh, the, the five doctrines of, of Calvinism. Uh, so to be fair, not all Calvinists hold these views uh, that I'm about to say, uh, but uh, the majority of them, I would say, do. Uh, Calvinism, uh, Cal a Calvinistic worldview says that God predetermines, causes, and controls everything. From a Calvinistic perspective, God has predestined everything to happen in a certain way. Uh, one of the most notable uh, Calvinistic leaders in uh, the world today um, is John Piper, and he says this, 
Uh, that would be, and he's talking about God's providence. He says that would be what we mean by God's providence. He sees to it that things happen in a certain way. So everything that happens was previously determined uh, by God to happen. Uh, predeterminism, uh, predestination. Um, every, everything that happens, every decision that you make, um, each world event that you see on the news, every thought that comes into your mind and all of the thoughts that haven't yet come into your mind, that will come into your mind, are preordained by God, um, are caused by God uh, under, under this worldview. Um, another tenet of Calvinism is that God caused, not only does God predetermine everything, but God causes all things. Uh, John Piper again says, everything that exists, including evil, is ordained by an infinitely holy and all-wise God to make the glory of Christ shine more brightly. And uh, one of his students, David Mathis, says, God does bring, bring sins about but always for his own good uh, purposes. So God is the originator. God is the author. Um, God is the designer of everything, of all things, even evil, they would admit. Um, so not, does all, not only does God uh, predestine, predetermine uh, all things, not only does he cause all things, but under this worldview, God controls all things. Uh, they often, you'll, when you listen to Calvinistic preachers, uh, one of their favorite words is sovereignty. Um, I believe in the sovereignty of God as it's biblically defined. Um, but they will define sovereignty um, as God controlling all things, God orchestrating all things, and being uh, the one who oversees all, uh, all things. And now we'll get back to this here in a moment um, when we talk about uh, uh, what, what the Bible has to say about this. Uh, but let's leave that idea for just a moment. Another worldview is the deistic worldview. Um, and that's, that, that worldview, um, which many people embrace today, says that God is completely uninvolved. Uh, God created the world. He created everything that you see around you, all of the complexity and all of the, uh, the, the design that you, that you see within the, within the cosmos. God is the author of that. Uh, but then once he created everything, he stepped back from his creation um, and does not intervene in particular human affairs. Um, that's a basic tenet of deism. God was involved in the creation of the world but remains uninvolved and unconcerned with particular human events. Uh, a, pr a preacher in the Brotherhood, Chuck Horner, who preaches, who does classes for a World Video Bible School, um, he, I was looking at some of his thoughts and material, um, and, and he was talking about deism, and, and he said this, uh, speaking about deism in reference to Christians. He says, too many Christians are deists in their way of thinking on the subject of providence. We must understand the providence of God in order to understand the relationship of God to the world in general and Christians specifically. So our God that we worship and serve did not create the cosmos, create the world, and step back and has no involvement in your life. He is uh, very involved in your affairs and very interested um, in your life and, and works on your behalf if you have submitted to him. Um, so let's look at uh, a, what I believe to be a Christian worldview uh, of God and, uh, and, um, and, and how God works in the world. Uh, I would say a Christian worldview, a Christian perspective, is that God is a person. God is not a, a force. Uh, God is a person concerned with his creation God is in control of all things, and God actively works to accomplish his purposes in the world. Um, so let's look at that first idea of the definition of a Christian worldview. God is a person. 
Now, when I say God is a person, I know the Bible teaches that God is a spirit. I'm not saying that um, in, in, a, in a human sense is he a person. God is a person in the sense that he is a self-aware, rational being with a personality. Unlike pantheism that teaches God is everything. God is everything that you see around you. No, God has a mind. God has emotions. God has a will. God has a personality. God essentially is a person, an individual person with a mind of his own. In Psalm 92, verse 5, it says, How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. Uh, of course, only a, a being with a rational mind can perform a work, can do something. And only a being with a rational mind can have thoughts. Uh, so, and that's exactly what this passage says. How great are your works and how deep are your thoughts. So in that sense, God is a person and that he has a mind and he has uh, cognitive ability. Um, in Genesis chapter 6... Verse 5 through 6, it uh, references God's uh, emotions in, in reference to his personhood. In, in verse 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So only a being, only a being with the capability of rational thinking, uh, only a being with an independent mind can experience emotions, uh, can experience emotions in, in a similar way that, uh, that we do. Uh, and lastly, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. And again, only a self-aware being can have a will. Um, every single one of us have a will. We have a, a, a purpose in mind. Uh, God has a, uh, only, only a being with, with a mind. Only a person um, can have a will. And the Bible clearly teaches that God has a will. Um, so God, uh, he's not a, uh, a force, um, like on, you see on Star Wars. Uh, God, is not a, uh, um, God is not in everything. God is not everything. This podium is, is not God. God is omnipresent. God is everywhere at once, but he in himself is not all things at the same time. Uh, God is a person. He's a self-aware being with a rational mind that's able to make uh, decisions and has a will. Uh, so secondly, under a Christian worldview of God and, and how God works in the world, God is in control of all things. Now notice that I said the Calvinistic worldview teaches that God, their definition of sovereignty is that God controls all things. God controls everything that you see around. He orchestrates every. He's the author of it all. I believe that a more biblical definition of sovereignty, I believe in the sovereignty of God with all of my heart, but I believe a more biblical definition of sovereignty is that God is in control of all things, rather than that he controls all things, if that makes sense. Uh, a biblical scholar, Jack Cottrell, um, he's of the Christian church, um, and they believe uh, many of the same things that we do. Um, they, uh, for the most part, they're non-Calvinistic. He says this, the biblical view is that divine sovereignty is God's absolute lordship over all things, understood not in terms of causation, but in terms of control, being in control, he says. God exercises complete control by causing some, not all, things to happen and by permitting the rest. So God is in control of all things, but not, but not the original cause of all things. Um, 
Just like a, they use an earthly illustration, just like a, a king um, that's an earthly king that's in control of every aspect of his kingdom. He's sovereign. He has the ability and the power to do whatever it is he wants to do within his kingdom. He has the power to do whatever, he is, whatever it is that he wants. Uh, but he doesn't orchestrate at the same time the actions of his followers. They rather possess their own free will, own free will choice to either follow or reject the king. Uh, just one biblical passage, we could uh, belabor this, but we're not going to. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, uh, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. So by God's own choice, He permits us to use our free wills even when we go against His own will for us. And He will respect our free will decision, whatever that uh, may be. Okay, so... Uh, the point that I really want to get at and the, the meat of tonight's introductory uh, lesson is that God promises uh, one of the, the basic ideas of uh, pro God's providence. God promises that he is still at work in the world today. Look in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 33. Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now God's promise in this passage is that He will give me what I need when my heart is solely is focused on seeking Him. God provides. God, God offers providence, provision, foresight over my life when I seek Him and when I, when I surrender my heart to Him. In other words, He works in my life when I am His child. In uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 through 31, it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now, of course, we know that Jesus is uh, the, the, the idea here is that if, if God watches over sparrows, if God offers providence and foresight over His creation, how much more is He going to work in the lives of those that are His, his children and work upon even the hearts that are not His children and lead them to uh, a, a place where they can hear the gospel and in an opportunity to, to repent of their sins? If God cares about His created order and His creation, how much more will He care about you and intervene in your affairs and work to accomplish your salvation and work for you in your life to draw you deeper to Him as you keep in step with Him? Uh, look in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. One of the chief goals of providence, and this is what we're going to talk about next week, Lord willing, in fact. One of the chief goals of providence is the benefit of man. God's provision for man to cause his greatest good, to cause his benefit. We may not understand what God does at times, but we can be assured that He is certainly working in our lives, and it is for our good. That is His will. That is His purpose, to bring about the joy of all peoples, to bring about the joy of all mankind. And He works, He intervenes in the affairs of man to accomplish that 
task. God works in the world today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, and Lord willing, we'll talk more about this in a later lesson. It says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure, endure it. <clears throat> so God even works during your temptation. Uh, he helps you through it and, and gives you a way of escape. God provides uh, for you when uh, your Satan comes knocking on the door of your heart. He offers you a way of escape. He helps you to overcome if um, when, 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 uh, when your heart is, is, um, is in step with Him, um, He helps you even within temptation. Uh, what, what an amazing thought. On all, every single one of us, we're all, we're all tempted uh, by uh, various temptations. Um, I'm tempted by things that you may not be tempted by. You may be tempted by things that, that I may not be tempted by. And God knows all of that. He offers a way of escape and He helps us through it, um, that it, his providence surely does. And then lastly, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 6, it says, Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? He remains faithful, the text says, and presently works in our lives to draw us closer to Him. He will never leave you, nor will He ever forsake you. When you are on top of a mountain in, uh, in the throes of joy, when you are experiencing jubilation in your heart, and when you are in the deepest, darkest valley, God is there. God is offering you, uh, God, is, God is providing for you. He's offering foresight to you and, and, and guiding you through each and every uh, phase of your Christian experience, each and every step of your journey. God promises that He is still at work in the world today. Uh, now let's look at two brief uh, kinds of providence. There are two uh, general, um, gen general kinds of providence that the Bible teaches. The first is general providence, um, and that's God's continued care for His entire creation. Not just humanity does God care for, and not just humans does God intervene in the affairs of, but God also cares for um, and works in the cosmos in the universe, in the created order. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14, it says, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. All of the creation, the Bible says, everything that has been made belongs to God and He is the sustainer of it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, teaches this idea even further. It says, Jesus says, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God, in essence, is like, um, God is like the battery of this universe. He is what makes everything tick. God didn't just give the universe life and then back away like a deistic worldview would say. God didn't just create the world and then, and then step away from His creation and allow it to function on its own. God, the Bible teaches that God continues to energize everything that He has created and God continues to maintain and sustain everything that you see around you. Can you, can you comprehend how uh, the, the massive body of earth that we're living on has the power to rotate? Uh, and, and all of, all of the, the galaxies and, um, and, and, and the celestial bodies and everything that we see, 
uh, within the universe and in the cosmos. Uh, what keeps all that going? <laughs> What's the power source behind all of it? Our God is. Our God sustains his creation. He didn't just create it and back away. He is the sustainer of all life and all, every bit of his creation. Acts chapter 17 verse 25 teaches this even further. It says, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So not only is God the sustainer of the created order, he maintains and sustains human life itself. Uh, life is so very precious. Uh, we, man, we can't create life. We can't sustain life. Um, it's, it, it's not possible for, for us uh, to do so. But God, um, in His infinite power and, and wisdom, has the power to create life and is the sustainer of my life. The only reason that I am alive today and thriving and functioning in a relationship with God is not because of anything that I have done, not because of any of my works or my own devices, but Him and Him alone. He sustains the very breath within me and exerts all power and, and, um, and sustenance to me. Uh, so that's one kind of providence, general providence, his continued care for not only humanity. Um, that's what we often think of when we think of providence. Um, God's providing for his, uh, for, for his followers, for the faithful. Uh, but also within providence, the doctrine of providence, God also is providing for creation. Everything that you see around you, he cares for it. Um, and he wants it to, um, he wants it to thrive. Uh, okay, so secondly, let's see, we just have a few minutes here. Let's look at, let's finish this up and then we'll, um, actually, let's see. Let's go ahead and skip. We'll come back to this next week. Let's look at the value of a study like this. Um, just a few points here um, that, uh, that will hopefully give us encouragement to, uh, to keep listening and, and growing in. Um, the, this study has uh, many, many values. This study is so profitable, I believe, when, when we take it seriously and, and, and when, when we uh, ingest what, what, what this doctrine of providence that we find in the Bible has to teach us. Uh, one of the values of this study is, uh, is, that, uh, is that an understanding of God's providence, it gives us a deeper sense of God's continued care in our lives. Um, a lot of the time, you know, even, even seasoned Christians, we know intellectually that God cares for us. We know that the Bible says intellectually that God is interceding on our behalf and that he has compassion on us and that he's going to forgive us. But we oftentimes don't act like that. And oftentimes it's not our, um, it's, it's not our natural thinking to think, you know, even, if I, even when I sin and I repent and I come back to God, God still cares for me. Um, a lot of the time it's not our natural reaction to think like that. I believe that a study of God's divine providence will help bolster uh, our emotional knowledge of God's love and his compassion and his care for us. Um, I just think that it's absolutely amazing that each and every single time a sinner repents and genuinely repents <coughs> and turns toward the Savior um, in, in, in a state of brokenness and, and humility, God's consistent reaction all throughout the Bible is always mercy and compassion and grace for the one who genuinely repents, no matter what they've done in their life, no matter what sins that they've committed. The one who submits to the Messiah Jesus will taste the mercy of God. 
And as we study God's providential care and His guidance and His, and His work in this world, how He works for my good, for my benefit, for my joy to draw me closer to Him, that will inevitably increase my emotional knowledge of God's love and His compassion and His mercy and His care for me. That's a value that we get from this study. Also, an understanding of God's providence, it encourages us to serve Him more fervently. Uh, since God is, is working in, in the world, um, and, and, and since I, I have this now, this, uh, this deeper understanding of, of how God works, and, and I know that He's actively working in this world, that, that emboldens me and gives me more passion and encouragement to serve Him and participate in His work. And then lastly, as we close tonight, an understanding of God's providence helps us to realize that our labor for the Lord is not in vain. Our God is not dead. Our God is not a deistic God that created the world and stepped away from it. Our God is actively working in the world. And everything you do for Him has purpose, has value, and has meaning. And I can know because of the doctrine of providence that everything I do under the banner of Messiah Jesus has purpose and value. Everything you do uh, for the Lord is not in vain. Thank you for your attention, and we will continue next week.